Ten years ago, um, tonight's speaker came to the Graham Foundation and gave a brilliant lecture on a reading of Palladio's uh, Churches in Venice. Uh, two years after that, I had the great and good fortune to spend three months with him at the American Academy in Rome and along with others such as Thomas Gordon Smith got to accompany him on a number of truly moving tours that I, for, that I in, in my case, certainly changed my life. Uh, in any case, there is, one could talk a great deal about him. The, um, I will give you just a very brief smattering of information. Um, he was educated at Yale and New York University. His honorary degrees from uh, Kenyon College, the University of Maryland, uh, the, Maryland, the Maryland Institute of Art, uh, the University of Venice. He's a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, the Royal Academy of Arts, the Academia Oli uh, Olympica in Vicenza, and the Royal Academy of Uppsala. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a fellow and former trustee of the American Academy in Rome. Uh, he's been decorated as a grand officer in the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic. He has lectured and taught in many, many institutions. Um, I have had the pleasure of having him on juries uh, when I was a visiting critic at Harvard. Uh, but his books on Michelangelo and Palladio in particular have actually done more to influence contemporary architects today in their reading uh, of history than any other person that comes to my mind. Um, he has made films about uh, Palladio and his influence in America. He's just completed uh, a book on villa studies and the ideology and design uh, of country residences, which Princeton Press will publish in 1989. Uh, it's a great pleasure, and I want you to help me welcome uh, James Ackerman. Again, I'd like to say that on the occasion of uh, the time that we spent together in Rome, uh, Stanley was uh, at least as much of a stimulus uh, for me in my thinking about architecture as he claims I was for him, so it comes out even. Uh, at the end of most lectures of this kind, the audience is asked, uh, if they have any questions of the speaker, and then there's an embarrassed uh, silence for a while, and uh, then the speaker says, well, if there are no questions, I'll see you later. Uh, tonight, uh, I have some questions for you at the end of the uh, talk, and uh, so that will let, leave you off the hook. There is already a social component in the architectural thought of the earliest Renaissance theorists. In discussing the design of cities, Alberti, Francesco di Giorgio, Filarete, and Serlio were concerned primarily with the psychological and physical well-being of the privileged classes, and to that end advised zoning according to class and to trade. Uh, in these two slides, you get uh, on the left, it's probably hard to see what is indicated uh, here, uh, but uh, Filarete's idea of the center of a town uh, divides uh, everything very neatly. Uh, 
Here is the uh, mayor's uh, palace, uh, the main uh, uh, church, uh, the merchant's uh, piazza, uh, the uh, residence of the major guilds, uh, the cathedral, and so on. Uh, the prison is down here, and it's got different parts of it devoted to different kinds of crimes. And uh, this is characteristic of the kind of classification that uh, went on at the time. Uh, on the other side, you see a sheet out of Serlio's uh, design for urban housing. And on the far left, you have uh, a dwellings for the lowest class. And on the right, you have dwellings for the artisan class. And each class is designated to its own kind of uh, dwelling place. Uh, here there is a kind of one and a half room arrangement <clears throat> in a long railroad flat, uh, which is remarkably prophetic of tenements of later periods, and that comes from uh, 1550 or thereabout. Alberti, who did no drawings, proposed the city arranged in concentric rings with the artisan and service classes in the center and the privileged classes out on the periphery, uh, which is a little bit like what's happened in the 20th century. And the prince uh, for Alberti is still farther out. He also assigned a peripheral site to noisy and smelly workplaces such as slaughterhouses. Serlio's unpublished sixth book, which you see on the right, is structured entirely according to social categories, and it offers designs of dwellings for every rank in society, from the poorest peasant to royalty. On the whole, the housing proposed by all the theorists represents an improvement over actual practice for every class. But Renaissance urban theory had a negligible impact on practice. Uh, cities continued the unplanned arrangements that uh, mixed all the classes together. It was just more convenient for those who made the decisions to live where the goods and services were and to house the productive poor on the ground floor of palaces or in decaying bourgeois dwellings. But there were revealing exceptions to uh, of ameliorative government action based on social policy, even before the era of the theorists. In the 14th century, uh, which you see, uh, you see a detail from the map of Venice in 1500 here, and um, on it, uh, you see this uh, area here, which is an example of housing for sailors. The Venetian Senate provided mass housing near the shipyards, and these were retired sailors, and the development uh, is called the Marinarezza, which was livable enough to function to the present day. Uh, you see just the edge of another housing development uh, here, row housing, which has a court in the center of it. It's just out of the map here. These are the shipyards here called the Arsenale in Venice, and this is part of the lagoon down here. But this goes back to about uh, 1348. A century later, there were similar interventions in Ferrara on the right, where, exceptionally, a new town was constructed following an architect's design. I think uh, this was the only new town uh, in, until the building of Livorno in the late 16th century, uh, the only practical town. There were new towns built uh, for military reasons, but they really were just uh, places to put garrisons. Uh, and in this case, uh, this was for indigent widows who were uh, placed uh, along this uh, street in Ferrara. In Augsburg, a private developer, the Fugger Bank, created a lower-income neighborhood, uh, which still exists today. You see it on the right. 
And uh, you see in the plan here on the left from a 17th century uh, woodcut plan, uh, the layout remarkably like that in Venice with these uh, row houses uh, put uh, in uh, subsequent, uh, 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 in rows one after uh, the other. And then there's a kind of an L shape uh, here and here that continues it. It's uh, almost like a, uh, a, s a separate uh, section. You go into a gate, as you see over here, and it's isolated from the area around. It'd be interesting to know why it was isolated in this way, whether it was a kind of ghetto situation or not. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a characteristic housing uh, s uh, solution of the time. Uh, incidentally, there's just been built in Venice uh, a brand new uh, section of row housing uh, built uh, in, in this way by the architect uh, Valle. Uh, similar examples could be cited in the course of the following centuries of government by aristocrats, kings, and emperors. Significant change in the social attitude of architectural and urban theorists becomes noticeable only during the 18th century, prompted by the Enlightenment, by political upheavals of the American and French revolutions, and a few decades later by the urban crisis then generated by the Industrial Revolution. The ideal city of Ledoux, which you see there on the right, was influenced by egalitarian political philosophy. It resembled Serlio's work in proposing distinct building types for different citizens, but significantly by their calling and not by their social rank, so that you'd have a place for uh, the tax collector, and another place for the baker, and so on. Uh, and each of these buildings tried to express the character of this person's calling. In this, it anticipated uh, the great proliferation of building types in the 19th century. Uh, there was this tremendous outburst of uh, new specialized typology of architecture beginning after the moment of Ledoux in the late 18th century. While Serlio was concerned only with houses, Assuming that most people would work at home, Ledoux was concerned, in addition, with a wide variety of workshops, factories, and institutional centers. Conditions of uh, the 19th century industrial centers, the great megalopoli of the early uh, industrial age, uh, which uh, re responded to a shift in population where the rural population came into the towns, uh, caused theorists and designers who saw the miserable conditions in which workers at that time were, to which they were uh, relegated, uh, the, there was great effort to attempt to provide a better way of life uh, on the part of uh, the theorists of this time. On the left here, you see uh, Augustus Welby Pugin's uh, proposals uh, for a, a new way of life coming out of a book he called Contrast. Now, Pugin was a, a Catholic convert who believed that by returning to the uh, medieval community, you would get a new kind of collaboration among people and a new spirit in life. And he proposed that uh, there should be a return to this imagined glory of the Middle Ages when everybody was happy. And uh, he used in this book of contrast uh, the opportunity to show how miserable everything was today and how lovely it might be if we could uh, restore uh, the situation in the Middle Ages. And this is one of many plates, and it illustrates the poorhouse. And in the poorhouse, 
uh, below, you have this wonderful ample building and in the vignettes all around the uh, men of religion uh, treating the poor uh, with kindness and sympathy. And up above you have this uh, prison house uh, of a environment uh, with Dickensian characters, this one with shackles and a whip and then the uh, figure up on the top uh, confined to solitary and then the bodies of the dead being dumped unceremoniously into the fields and uh, food being nothing but gruel. Uh, it, uh, it's a very exaggerated uh, situation. It, it reads a little bit uh, like the criticism of modernist architecture on the part of uh, postmodernists. Uh, on the right, you see the arrangement proposed by Fourier who uh, wanted to create a community of people with uh, everything joined into one center, which would be the focus of an area with factories and uh, places of production. And he would pull together the families into a single institution called a phalanstery. Uh, in this case, one that was built in the town uh, of Guise and uh, which actually functioned for uh, a considerable amount of time. And though it was grim and institutional uh, as uh, Pugin would have it, it still offered a great deal of amenities not uh, available in the industrial towns. At the end of the century, there's the uh, case of uh, Ebenezer Howard who proposed the, what he called the Garden City of Tomorrow. And uh, in this proposal, which is a schematic plan, you have the underpinnings of the garden suburbs uh, built in various parts of uh, England initially and also in uh, America shortly after. Uh, the most notable early example being Riverside, Illinois, in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, this comes out of the thinking of Ebenezer Howard, uh, the potentialities of new towns being made possible by the invention of the railroad and the possibility that one could work in a suburb at commute to a city, and later on the motor car carried this out. Uh, but it all starts at the end of the century. The purpose of this uh, historical preamble is to call to mind that architects have been preoccupied over many centuries uh, with the ways in which architecture relates to the institutions and functions of society. As social organization has changed, the most innovative architectural ideas have attempted to accommodate the new situation. In a sense, the late 19th century catchphrase, form follows function, was old stuff. What was new was the definition of which functions ought to be followed. The significant function in earlier centuries was representation. The first requirements of Renaissance building was to advertise the political and economic statu status and the intellectual interest of the client. And to this, and, uh, to this end, clients were prepared to suffer considerable inconvenience and bodily discomfort. Ledoux and Pugin responded to the changed social structures of their time, not by abandoning the representational functions, but by interpreting them more in terms of the community than of the individual. But at the dawn of the modern era, political and social convictions created a split in concepts of function. The traditional representational functions remained paramount among those who wished to advertise their power and wealth, but to others, for example, Louis Sullivan and Montgomery Schuyler, the traditional form of display began to seem incongruous with a democratic and open society. Uh, 
and most representational architecture was also subject to the criticism that it was simply retrospective and lacked the kind of relevance to the society that could be claimed for Renaissance or neoclassical architecture. At this point, a competing concept of function began to take hold, which was partly behavioral and utilitarian in nature, that is, seeking efficiency and convenience, stimulated in part by the growing prestige of scientific investigation. But this new view of function was also a bid for a new kind of representation, one that should bespeak egalitarian ideals and ethical principles of a rather Puritan sort such as honesty, purity, and cleanliness. Much of the confusion that ensued in the discussion of the social role of architecture derived from an unwillingness to recognize that the functionalism of utility did not drive out the functionalism of representation. Modern buildings had as much to say for themselves as those of the Beaux-Arts. Surely a major factor in my concern with the social role of architecture is autobiographical because I first became aware of contemporary architecture at a moment when it was a burning issue. It was a few years before World War II, not long after Hitchcock and Johnson in their book of 1932 first told Americans about the existence of what they called the international style. That book, however, did not represent the so-called so modern movement in its social context, but in a typical formalist terms of the art criticism of its time. Formalist criticism isolated the work of art or architecture from other aspects of life and history and focused on the character and interaction of spaces, of planes, of rhythms, and so forth. The significant context in which any particular work of art was to be understood was exclusively one of other comparable works. The introduction of that book announces that, quote, the authentic, the aesthetic quality of the style are the principal concerns of the authors of this book. One chapter is devoted to a vigorous attack on functionalism which it represents only in terms of the utilitarian function as a mechanic, mechanistic enemy of aesthetic quality. The social relevance of all the architecture discussed was acknowledged only by slighting references to some of the workers' housing of the previous decade. Early modern designs uh, seek a vocabulary for new techniques. Uh, and an expression of equality. Uh, they, these are two uh, plates out of uh, Tony Garnier's uh, study for the Cité Industrielle, the industrial city. And uh, in it, there is a very vigorous effort to find a vocabulary for architecture that comes out of the uh, technique of reinforced concrete. Uh, everything in this city is poured and uh, the forms uh, show a relationship to this. They're more, uh, the, uh, anything like, uh, like um, Southwestern Adobe, which is uh, also done in a, a malleable uh, uh, material. And uh, in fact, Garnier was relatively successful in finding some kind of expressive vocabulary other than the purely uh, technological, which is at the base. And uh, the, uh, this direction towards a, a social application of architecture uh, is, uh, uh, comes to the fore very strongly in the post-World War I uh, era due to the fact that throughout Europe there are socialist governments set up at that time which backed public uh, accommodations and, and particularly housing all through the 20s and uh, the architects in those periods were able to design for all classes. Uh, here we have the well-known uh, voisin plan of Le Corbusier of 1923 to 25. Le Corbusier laid down uh, the basis for modern urban design uh, 
and uh, the bases, which was essentially followed in American and other cities in uh, the subsequent decades. Uh, the mixture of high and low rise building, uh, the uh, focus of the building around uh, routes of transport, uh, the uh, building up of the building over the level of the ground in order to provide open space on the ground, and uh, the use of high-rise uh, ostensibly to get uh, green areas around the buildings and to provide open air environments, and the uh, complete the clearing of any area before buildings should start, uh, leaving nothing of the preceding environment. And all of this became a, a rule for urban planning in the post-World War II period, and it, uh, it ushered in an era in which uh, planning uh, became as much a destructive as a constructive uh, procedure. Uh, this, uh, however, was, uh, uh, in, in my mind, doesn't uh, vitiate the uh, initial vision. It uh, is a vision that uh, proved uh, many years later not to be successful in certain contexts where it was used. Uh, it had an enormous impact more than any other urban thinking uh, of any time. Uh, and we must remember that uh, Le Corbusier had a love affair with the machine and was uh, fixated on the efficiency, uh, attempting to bring the uh, efficiency of uh, the manufactured object into the living environment. Another instance of uh, the, uh, the work of that time is the gropious uh, effort to develop a uh, universal unit to be used in housing that uh, would make it uh, possible to get uh, along with uh, uh, prefabricated uh, elements and to build a, a varied kind of structure with the units that were mass produced. Uh, in uh, th the delay uh, of this kind of thinking in America reached uh, up until the 50s, that is to say, uh, there was not much concern uh, with uh, theorizing on these matters uh, at, at a period before uh, the Second World War, except uh, in the case of Lewis Mumford, who in his uh, historical and critical writing uh, was continually pressed on uh, the public and on architects, uh, the responsibility to think of issues of this uh, sort. There's a, there's a paranoia about socialist uh, solutions that is uh, constant in American civilization. And uh, this uh, it was, it was certainly true in architectural thought. Uh, here, however, in 1935, on the left, you have the uh, utopian scheme of Frank Lloyd Wright for the city, where every citizen would uh, have an acre which he could partly cultivate. Uh, uh, that's a broad acre city on the right in the model. And uh, it carries on the Jeffersonian uh, tradition. Jefferson also felt that America should remain agricultural and that uh, each person should be on the land uh, producing his own thing. Of course, when Jefferson wrote uh, the America was over 90% agricultural and rural in its population, and in 1935, uh, that had uh, gone down uh, uh, tremendously, so that this uh, solution uh, proved not to be one that could be taken up uh, very much by uh, practical planners. Uh, now, after the early 20s, uh, the uh, social uh, element in architectural thought was very much carried on by the uh, CIAM uh, that uh, began in the mid-20s. Uh, uh, in uh, the slides here, you see on the left an illustration of uh, 
the meeting for out of the meetings of the CIAM in uh, 1929 and the theme of those meetings was uh, the housing uh, minimal housing arrangements and these are examples of units uh, proposed uh, in housing scheme which are indeed minimal but which are intended to uh, make possible a, a very large scale expansion of housing potentiality on the other side on the far side uh, out of the 1936 uh, meetings of the CIAM, uh, the analysis of the city core was the theme at that time of those two uh, Swiss uh, studies uh, that uh, attempted to uh, break down the apportionment of uh, the population within the city uh, and to use the analysis as the basis for amelioration. Uh, Corbusier and other modernist associates formed uh, this Congrès International de l'Architecture Moderne in the late 20s to create an ongoing forum of leading architects concerned with the interaction of architectural and urban design and with mass housing. The social thrust of this aspect of contemporary architecture became more apparent in writings of the 40s primarily in Gideon's Space Time and Architecture and Pevsner's Pioneers of Modern Design, which were required reading in every architectural school in the country until the early 60s. Social awareness manifested itself in two distinct ways. The first, which is uh, usually called up by the term functionalism, was concerned with redesigning traditional building types so that they conform better with the behavioral patterns of the users. Typical examples would be the design of efficient kitchens with easy access to dining areas, uh, as in Wright's uh, Usonian houses uh, built on, uh, here we have uh, the scheme of the Us Usonian house on the left uh, and a example of one on the right. Uh, built on a slab without basements and with radiant uh, heating. Uh, a plan where everything remained very open within the house. And uh, one uh, finds it uh, difficult to estimate, as I'll say in a moment, the extent to which this uh, corresponds to and generates a change in living habits that uh, come with a new society, uh, the most revolutionary kind of conception. Uh, the, uh, the, this is uh, one of the elements. Uh, another one in, in, in that line would be Le Corbusier's alternate floor access to apartments in the Unité d'Habitation. Uh, the second uh, category I'm speaking about was concerned with pressing urban problems of the modern super city. Overall urban design in the tradition of the Renaissance makers of ideal cities, solution for low cost and low income housing and transportation. Let's call these two liberation for the first and amelioration for the second. Uh, what excited us as students was uh, awakening to the possibility that the struggle of the new architecture for recognition could be associated with efforts to realize a social order of increased equality and freedom. To evaluate this, one has to reconstruct the 19th century context in which the modern design was operating in the 20s and 30s. As Frank Lloyd Wright repeatedly complained, the typical middle-class house was broken up into many small rooms serving more specialized functions than were necessary or desirable at a moment when the supply of live-in servants was declining. The light was restricted and the furnishing were overstuffed and oversized. The outmoded representational vocabulary of university buildings, banks, and apartment blocks hampered the kind of design that would either facilitate work and living or communicate values that a new generation felt distinguished itself from the old. There really was a great gap between the values and manners of the generation of the Edwardians and Teddy Roosevelt and that of the Roaring Twenties of Hemingway, Lawrence, and Faulkner and the Depression Radicals. Modern architecture proposed an environment that gave shape to the desire to escape the era of stuffiness. 
It offered a physical liberation that com complemented the psychic liberation of a new generation. In criticism of modernism today, the fact of liberation is forgotten because it was so successful. Today, it seems that people must always have had houses and workplaces accommodated to modern life. And we are aware only of those aspects of modern design that failed to liberate or that created new uh, confinements. Modernism's devotion to amelioration was not just a concern of the early masters. After the Second War, a younger group of architects broke away from the CIAM to form Team 10 because they found their elders too utopian and because there, there were fewer socialist government to support social programs. They found ways to work with individual industrialists, local communities, even labor unions to realize housing and settlements. In the 60s, especially in this country, the anti-establishment spirit spawned advocacy design in which the architect attempted to play the role of the ad for the user in public and large-scale project, a kind of equivalent to public interest law practice. In its most extreme form, advocacy extended even to assigning not just the programming but architectural design to architect user teams. That led to some pretty incoherent buildings exhibiting a complexity and contradiction Venturi never dreamed of. The 60s constitute a watershed in the story of social concern in architecture. In Europe, support for socialist governments was waning. America had never given wide support to government enterprise, and many urban renewal schemes failed catastrophically to improve the lives of the poor. Uh, this is a lower income housing project uh, in New York, and the other one is a, is a higher income project in Los Angeles. Though the fault was primarily in social and political planning uh, or the structure of society, the failure naturally discredited the architectural concepts that had given shape to the plans. Toward the end of the decade, the engagement of communal institutions and in buildings, particularly universities, precipitously declined and commissions began to come primarily from large corporate clients, developers, and extremely wealthy home builders. The paradigm of the new age was the art museum, uh, which proliferated in the 70s. Whether nominally public or private, American museums are controlled by the same elite. In the absence of the forces that encouraged amelioration in early decades, the governments, communities, and nonconformist millionaires the concept lost its appeal. But not only the social aims of modern architecture were subverted at this time, the style itself was adopted and neutralized by corporate wealth. The bland glass box of innumerable skyscrapers transformed the in innovations of the earlier 20th century into a fashionable form without meaning, to the point that we now needed a second liberation uh, here we have downtown Houston as, uh, as an example. And the ideals of modernism were blamed for the travesties committed in its name. It was inevitable that some kind of postmodernism should emerge to counter this uh, trend. Uh, Stanley Targerman himself speaks of this change, of his disillusion with what goes on here in his book, uh, Verses. But such postmodernism had a choice between seeking to reinvest architecture with a new and independent prospect of its significance to society and offering to the corporate image, to the corporate world, a new image. In general, it has chosen the latter alternative. In fact, I see a work like Venturi and Company's Learning from Las Vegas as being a primer for collaboration with an encouragement of the corporate image makers. <coughs> What's good uh, about the principles of this book, which are kind of hard to read from these slides, is that it points out the symbolic potential of architecture, which we had a hard time reading from the glass boxes. What's bad 
is that I think the roots were false, that uh, the imagery of Las Vegas or the American roadside does not come out of uh, America, uh, of the grassroots. It comes out of uh, the advertising agencies and uh, the corporations and developers. For me, there are a few instances of the first option. One, to stay with the written word would be Rossi's Architecture of the City and other essays, which accept the improbability of changing the world through architecture and looks to evolution rather than revolution. Rossi suggests that architecture should work out of, uh, got the wrong one here. Uh, Rossi suggests architecture should work out the underlying forms of the city's past, the types of buildings and building groups to address society through a revivifying of its memories and continuities. This doesn't define any practical design solutions, but it does give the designer responsibly more communal and more exalting uh, idea than the appeal to individual clients. But it's, uh, it's really applicable mainly to building in European environments with long histories rather than in a young country like ours. But paradoxically, I see in some of Venturi's work uh, more of the application of Rossi's principles than of his own. Uh, another rather more superficial uh, proposal uh, for the European typology comes out of uh, the Creer brothers. Uh, this one from Leon Creer, proposal for uh, a uh, remodeling of an area in Paris, which of course uh, involves the same kind of clearing of the area down the ground as Le Corbusier's does, and then the uh, reconstitution of it in a classical vocabulary. Uh, modernist amelioration is now dismissed as the naive or authoritarian effort of architects to take on tasks that either belong to others or are irrelevant. The attack comes from two quarters, from the right and the left. The right, which can be identified with writings of Peter Blake, Charles Jenks, Denise Scott Brown, and Robert Stern, proposes that true social responsibility is realized by architecture that conveys humanist values. It's hard to quarrel with platitudes that are not backed up by any serious articulation of principles. The impression given is that an ionic column, an oculus, or a pitched roof is a humanist value, regardless of how it's used. And one wants to know what humanist low-cost housing might look like. Uh, could we have the lights again? The attack from the left is represented by Manfredo Tafuri's architecture and utopia, which has been misserved by its miserable English translation. His argument is that a late capitalist environment provides uh, an uh, a inherently contradictory situation for social amelioration, because the efforts could be realized only by the powerful forces that cause the oppressive conditions requiring amelioration. Socially oriented architecture is utopian, reinforcing the contradictions of present day Western society by proposing cosmetic improvements that make it supportable. His answer is essentially to give up the effort so long as we remain in the pr uh, present political and social condition. This is parallel with uh, the approach to, of Eisenman in one sense, uh, though it's a political rather than a post-structural argument. Given the choice between a fuzzy disregard of the social dimension and paralysis of imagination in this respect, I'm arguing in favor of an engagement uh, that I see as a constant of architectural thought through the centuries. The neglect in current discourse of the social implications of architecture is in sharp contrast to the evolution of architectural history since the modernist period. And this contrast is a sign of disarray in our intellectual life. Architectural history in the course of 35 years that I've been practicing it
have moved steadily toward the interpretation of the architecture of the past in terms of social, political, and economic forces. The constricted formalism of Hiscock in Johnson's 1932 book, which fo focused on individual and period style evolving in an autonomous architectural culture, uh, was characteristic of both the historical and critical stance of that time. I felt uneasy with such uh, a limited uh, horizon, but it took me time to expand it. My book on Michelangelo's architecture, started in the mid-50s, made only a hesitant step away from the formalist position, while the one on Palladio, started in the early 60s, tried interpretation in terms of the economy of the Venetian Republic and the character of the Vicentine aristocracy and the evolution of church policy. Later, I faced the question of whether the writing of monographs on a single creative since it forces attention on the sequence of an individual's uh, works rather than on the context in which particular works were created. Now, I've just uh, completed a book uh, on a type, namely the villa from antiquity through uh, Le Corbusier, which one, uh, each one uh, attempts, each of the essays attempts to reconstruct the context which gave shape to a particular group of interrelated buildings. The whole is held together by the persistence of an ideology of well-off city dwellers that gives a particular aura to life in the country, an ideology that remains fundamentally unchanged from the time of Virgil to today's East Hampton. The current situation in historical interpretation is the outcome of a remarkable flowering of ideas in Europe during the 60s and 70s, involving structuralism and its analog uh, semiology, the uh, Nal group of historians in France, and neo-Marxism, notably that of the Frankfurt School. Uh, through the impact of this diverse development, uh, though the impact uh, cannot be uh, characterized in a sentence, the general thrust was to focus attention on the synchronic study of events or buildings in the light of the complexity of ideas uh, and the social, economic, and political conditions of their moment, rather than to see them in a diachronic term uh, as part of a sequence of like occurrences or buildings. Further, the neo-Marxist achievement was not simply to reveal the significance of the material economic base supporting the superstructure of cultural activity, but to open up the sphere of ideological criticism. This suggested to the historian that architectural works might be seen in terms of the ways in which they fulfill not only the stated needs of the client, that is, the program, but also those ideological needs that were subliminal, the unconscious requirements so intimately tied to the needs of the social and class structure that only an outsider like a historian or an anthropologist could perceive them. There's also newly developed uh, feminist criticism in architecture, which uh, reveals a whole lot of suppositions which are made in design, which are male dominated. This made it possible to subject the program itself, as well as the design of the building, to criticism. The historians that seem to me to be offering the most stimulating interpretations today are all in one way or another heirs of these Western European innovations. I think of Manfredo Tafuri, Mark Giroard, Joseph Connors, and many others. They show how new inspirations have made the writing of history more intensive and less extensive. They also made a lot of made a lot harder because the raw material was no longer just a collection of photographs and slides and some documents on construction, but required research into all the complexity of a past moment in time. The new history also seems to me to have a more durable value because no matter how taste and style may vary, the context it presents should continue to be relevant, even if later on they will require a vision and will no longer be seen in the same way. It seems paradoxical that criticism in the writings of architects have moved away from references to the social uh, 
context, while historians, not to speak of psychiatrists and anthropologists, have been moving toward them. <clears throat> We're all subject to the same intellectual influences, and we're all addressing the built environment. The fact that designers, now that they are employing motives from the past, have become much more sympathetic to history than they were at the end of the modernist period, ought to make for a community of outlook. But history, as it's seen in the postmodern mode, is not the same as ours. It's rather one of free-floating motives unrooted in their culture while we have become increasingly interested in roots. In one sense, the new history is isolated from the new architecture attuned to present-day society. In politics, there's been a retreat from efforts to define and deal in modern ways with major social deficiencies, such as housing, health care, and racial and sexual in inequities. The socialist parties abroad and even the Democratic Party at home are in disarray. All of the major Western governments are now headed by leaders suspicious of social programs and oriented to individual entrepreneurial initiative. The condition is analogous to the abandonment in architecture of social programming and the return to a focus on the individual client. We ought, however, to be able to come together in support of an architecture that is, has the capacity to transform as great architecture has done in earlier centuries those aspects of the architecture of the past uh, that arouse a response and stimulus to the imagination today. This means seeking a deeper knowledge of the forces that form past architecture and a committed search for the form that echoes the highest aspirations of today. It's easier for me to speak in this way than for any architect because I'm well protected from the pressures to force architects into works that compromise with quality and depth and that discourage them from tackling problems that no one is putting before them. But Wright's Broadacre City and Corbusier's Ville Radieuse were not conceived on commission, but as a way of articulating their ideas about the accommodation of modern life. It was an ethical dimension to their careers, an effort to serve not simply the fortuitous client, but the whole of humanity that is less in evidence today. The fact that some of the ameliorative design of modernist architects was unsuccessful, and that many of the design ideas were insufficiently integrated with sound social policy and implementation, is not a reason to abandon the effort. It should rather stimulate a search for alternative approaches, even if the economy and public policy is as unwelcoming as it must have been in the days of Alberti and Serlio. Whether or not public and private agencies are seeking ways in which the physical environment might be adjusted to alleviate social and economic problems, the problems are undeniably there. They are pressing even in this unimaginably wealthy and powerful country, and far more pressing in the third world. And architects, as specialists of the man-weighed physical environment, have the opportunity to suggest solutions that under more hospitable political conditions could ultimately stimulate further experiment in an abandoned area. That brings to a close what I had to say, and uh, I'd like to follow uh, with some of these questions that seem to me questions that uh, ought to be asked even if we have no answer to them. Uh, question one is, starts, part of the postmodern criticism of modernist architectural aims involves the claim that architects made matters worse in the 60s while trying to improve urban conditions. An example being the pruitt Igo housing development in St. Louis. The question, does the failure of most uh, social amelioration in housing, planning, and so forth demonstrate that the effort was misplaced that architects are not competent or justified in seeking to put forward concepts aimed at bettering the life of those not in power. <clears throat>
seems like the scale of those projects became so enormous. In fact, instead of just a dream of Corbusier, what actually was able to be done, the scale of which it was done, the contrast that the Rosette came to some of these early things in the Renaissance, uh, there was a problem of scale there that uh, it was just incapable at that gigantic level uh, to provide what the ideals were. Uh, it, it's interesting that the, the, uh, all of the criticism of uh, the faults of 50s housing and uh, urban solutions uh, uh, is literary. Uh, and none of it, or very little of it, is architectural and design. Uh, is there a reason for this? I mean, I, I, I follow uh, Professor Smith's uh, suggestion uh, here uh, that it's consistent with the criticism, but uh, where is the design solution? I want to raise the same question again. Uh, why, at this point, when we saw that that was the wrong direction, did there not come out of the architectural profession uh, proposals that would be the right direction? For example, Herbert Gans writes the uh, urban villagers and, uh, and uh, that there's the life and death of the American uh, city. Uh, and all these literary uh, attacks, uh, but uh, what inhibited a design attack on this? Yeah. Well, of course, Frank Lloyd Wright wasn't equipped either. At the uh, uh, his, uh, his solution was a, a utopia, and architects have generally dealt with utopias rather than with uh, the practical uh, planning procedures, uh, and utopias have been much more catchy than, uh, than books. Uh, uh, it, is, it, uh, it seems to be they could still be. I would say, I'm still thinking uh, that uh, architects uh, in this uh, political environment can, in fact, only make things on paper that would answer some of the problems that uh, were uh, the aim of Le Corbusier and Wright and others. Uh, and uh, the thrust uh, of what I'm saying is uh, that I would like to see these paper schemes. I think that they might uh, have an impact on, on bureaucrats. Uh, but uh, uh, essentially, uh, I, uh, this is what I'm saying has changed, that there have been paper schemes uh, throughout uh, history. And I don't think we're so cynical that we, we really are feeling uh, it's no use making those such things anymore. <laughs>
that's a, a worthwhile thing to think about. <laughs> Sorry, I did that, I didn't mean that as a put down. Uh, here's another question. What about the issue of pro bono work on behalf of uh, unprivileged clients? This is practiced in law, uh, as example in the protection of civil and consumer rights and the other, in medicine and in dentistry, the care of indigent pa patients, and rarely in architecture. Is there a valid reason for the difference? Uh, now, of course, uh, what, the obvious reason is that uh, people who are indigent uh, can't uh, become uh, clients in the normal sense, uh, but it seems to me there's a possibility uh, of a kind uh, of design using throwaway materials or whatever uh, that could be helpful. Uh, but I'd like to hear what you think about uh, this kind of responsibility in architectural design. I, I would like to 